Hello and welcome. My name is Stuart of IWantRouters.com from the city of Bristol in the UK. And if you're from the UK, you can probably tell where I come from by my accent. One of the most common subjects I get asked about these days is wireless networks. So I wrote a blog about it and this is the video version. I will try and explain the techno babble in easy terms so you don't have to be a techie to understand all of this and I will use analogies here and there. There are lots of pictures and diagrams to help clarify things. This is the first of a small series of videos. It's a general discussion aimed at home and small to medium sized businesses. Large companies will have their own IT departments to sort it all out for them. Having said that, I cannot think why the methods in this article cannot be scaled up to whatever size of network you want. The principles remain the same. I won't be giving you a step by step guide on how to plug in a router. There are plenty of videos and instructions that already exist to help you with this. Instead, I hope you will understand where it is you want to get to and how to get there by the time you get to the end of this. There are so many wireless devices these days. I think wireless connections are taking over from wired connections. There are devices such as tablets, phones, laptops, media systems, wireless storage, even desktops these days are attaching by wireless connection. The list is ever increasing. Wireless technologies are affected by nearly everything. Many people have a mobile phone and mobile broadband these days and you will know that when the signal is good everything works fine and when it's not then the service you get can work one minute and not the next. Sometimes you have a good signal that all of a sudden turns into a bad signal. The same can be true with wireless networks. So what does affect them? Well, people walking across the room, building structure, atmospheric conditions, the distances, the devices you use, objects in a room, walls and other devices. We are not going to unpick all of these things. Instead, it's better to concentrate on building a robust network and tackling any areas that do cause a problem. With a little thought and perhaps some experimentation, a reliable wireless network can be set up without spending too much. There are lots of options available now to help you set up wireless networks that work well and it's getting better all the time. The current wireless standard N is much better than the standards that went before it and most devices on this standard will work with the older wireless devices. Better standards will come along in the near future. The new AC standard is in draft as I speak. The range of a particular wireless N device is dependent on many things as already mentioned but you might get 70 meters indoors and I have seen up to 250 meters mentioned for outdoors. I think that would be exceptional. Now let's look at the ingredients of our wireless network. I may not mention everything here. There will always be something extra, but I will include the commonly used components. Wireless components from one manufacturer should work with another, but there is always a chance that there may be incompatibilities. So it is usually safer to stick with the same brand. In some part of your network, you will probably want to be attached to the internet. For many setups, this will be connecting to your broadband using a modem or a router. I should explain at this point that connection to the internet or WAN, which stands for Wide Area Network, is usually made to ADSL or cable broadband using a device called a modem. The data from the modem is then forwarded by a device called a router to the LAN, which stands for Local Area Network, which all of your devices will connect to. To make it easy, most homes and businesses use a device with a built-in broadband modem, router, switch and wireless access point. Here are some examples of various routers and modems with and without wireless. Except for the Dratic Viger 120, they all have a built-in security firewall. Starting from the left, the Billion 7800 is a medium cost router. It has a modem, router and four port switch built in. The Dratec Viger 120 is a simple modem and used just to connect your broadband supply. It can be plugged straight into a computer or a router that doesn't have a modem, for example. The D-Link 825 is a good quality router with a modem, router, switch and wireless. This one is aimed at media for those that like to watch videos and play music over the internet. The Dratec Viger 2850 is an all singing and dancing business class router with a built in modem, router, switch and wireless. It has a second one port which means you can plug in a second broadband supply to give you more capacity and more reliability. If one broadband supply should start working, the other will carry on. This is where the Dratec Viger 120 modem comes in handy 
for the second broadband supply. Now we come to wireless access points, which can be used to extend the range of your wireless network. If your office or home is bigger than the range of a single wireless device, is divided into offices or is on several floors, you may need more than just the router with a built-in wireless access point. If you do just need one router with its built-in wireless, then try and place it as centrally as possible, as this will probably give you the best wireless distribution. You could plug one or more access points into your network. Here's a diagram showing a router with two access points attached to the network. Let's say you are in a building with three floors, each a thousand foot square. The floors are pretty solid with materials in them that make it difficult for wireless signals to pass through and there is network cabling throughout the three floors. The router can be placed on one floor and wireless access points plugged in and configured on the other two floors. They can be configured to be part of the same wireless network so if you walk from the first floor to the third floor with your mobile phone, laptop or tablet, it will stay connected all the way. You may need a wireless access point placed in an area where there is no network cabling. As long as there is an electricity supply available nearby, you could use a wireless access point as a repeater. Repeater mode allows you to connect an access point wirelessly to another access point, like your router, and create its own wireless area. The signals of the two devices must overlap strongly enough to make this viable. You could have several wireless access points functioning as repeaters, as long as, long as they are around the same source device. You can daisy chain them so that the router is repeated by wireless access point 1 and wireless access point 1 is repeated by wireless access point 2, but you will start to suffer some degradation as info is passed back and forth up and down the chain. Wireless access points can be used to connect locations together. Let's say you have two buildings in a campus situation 50 metres away from each other with an access road in between. It would be difficult to lay a cable between the two locations as it would either need to go overhead or underground. One option is to attach appropriate aerials to the outside of both buildings so that they are pointing at each other and attaching the aerials in turn to wireless access points. The wireless network is then beamed between the two buildings. Here are three examples of wireless access points. The Draytec AP800 is a highly featured business class wireless access point. There is also an AP700 version aimed at domestic and small business situations and is reasonably priced. D-Link have many wireless access points and the DAP2690 is more of a heavyweight than the others, designed more for businesses right up to enterprise level. The Billion 2073N is a great way of extending a network using a mains electricity circuit. This one has a wireless access point built into it, great for home situations or small businesses. Another way of increasing the strength of signal, and consequently the range of wireless device, is to use better aerials. Aerial signal strength is measured in decibels. Most devices come supplied with 2 decibel or 3 decibel aerials, but it is possible to replace them with readily available aerials up to 10 decibels, which are quite a lot more powerful. There are two types of aerials we can use, omnidirectional aerials, which work in all directions 360 degrees around, and in the next slide, directional aerials, which focus the signal so that, for example, a strong signal can be beamed in a particular direction. This is really useful for bridging two locations together. Depending on their design, a stronger aerial can either directly replace the aerial or aerials you currently have or are linked to your device by a length of cable. Some aerials can be mounted on walls and some are suitable for outdoor use. It's worth noting that on some devices that come with more than one aerial, some of them might be used to transmit and receive, and some might be used to receive only. You can check the manual or data sheet that comes with your device to find this out. Here are a few examples. The Draytac ANT2510 is designed for indoors or outdoors and is a directional aerial. It's good for bridging one area to another and it's powerful. The Draytac ANT1005 aerials come in a pack of three and are designed to directly replace the aerials on routers such as the Draytec Viger 2850N. The D-Link ANT26 
0600 is another directional aerial for indoor use. And the D-Link ANT240501 is an omnidirectional aerial for indoor use that can be plugged into a device with a length of cable. It is useful not only because it has a stronger signal, but to change the position of an aerial if the device it's attached to is not kept in the best position for wireless use. Most devices, such as laptops, tablets, mobile phones, etc., have built-in wireless connectivity these days. And if it's a fairly recent device, then it will probably have wireless N. If your device doesn't have wireless connectivity, or it is just too old for wireless N, then this may not be a problem, as there are plug-in devices you can use to get around this. For anything that can utilise a wireless connection with a suitable USB socket, a wireless dongle will add wireless or upgrade the existing wireless. The Billion Bipack 3011N is shown here, but there are lots to choose from. If you have a desktop that you want to add wireless to or upgrade it, then a PCI card such as the one shown here is another option. Just make sure you have a spare slot before you get one. Before or after you set up your wireless network, you might want to perform a wireless survey. This is about the strength of signal you are going to, or do get, in the places you need wireless to work. Performing a survey before you set up a wireless network is a more involved process and will probably cost more, but if you have a complex site to manage, then this might be the best option. If you survey after you have set up your wireless network, then it's easier and doesn't cost much if anything, but you may have more adjustments to make this way. In summary, a complex site, better to survey before. A simple site, a survey after will probably be fine. As I said before, everything affects wireless technologies, so things like thick walls still work in a building structure, the distance from access points, etc. can all have an effect. If you decide you survey before the wireless network is set up, then there are a few ways of approaching this. You can either obtain equipment and do it yourself, or hire someone who has the equipment already to perform a wireless survey. If you decide to set up the wireless network first with a little judgement, and then adjust things as you go along, there are some simple apps for Apple and Android tablets and mobile phones you can use. They may not be regarded as professional, if anyone wants to get snobby about it, but they will do the job. I have been using Wi-Fi Analyzer on an Android phone, and mine is an HTC Desire HD, which seems to work pretty well. Whichever way you do it, please consider the following before you start. What are the areas you want the wireless network to cover? A floor plan would be really helpful here. Identify the objects that might affect the wireless network, such as walls, halls, elevators and floors. You might need some extra devices or careful sighting of them to get around these things. Identify where the wireless network will be used. Identify where it won't be used, as you don't need to cover these areas. Depending on where you want to site the access points or aerials, consider where any network or mains cables need to run, and are there mains outlets available where you need them. Access points are best mounted high, near or on the ceiling is good. Watch out for metal or concrete walls or structures that can interfere with wireless signals. How many access points do you need? If they are wireless N, you are indoors and there is a clear line of sight, then 25 meters radius per point might be sufficient, although a smaller radius is probably better. Once you have everything up and running, make a rough map of the wireless areas and the strength of signal there. Monitor and adjust as necessary by reciting access points, using different aerials, adjusting aerial positions or increasing the number of access points. The phone app is really good for this. It's like baking a cake. Adjust the ingredients until the wireless network works as you need it. Some free post wireless setup mapping software for your PC, laptop and phone or tablet can be attained from www.ekahow.com. I guess that's enough for now. Now we know about some of the equipment we can use. In the next article, part 2, I will talk about configuration and how the wireless network may behave. My name is Stuart from I Want Routers and thanks for visiting.